we got a really good group of, of you know high character players and that's the main reason why we've we've been able to to improve and, and do well here over the last month um and um so if i had a if i had a group of guys that weren't bought in and didn't weren't high character guys i think it would have been a lot harder but i'm fortunate to have a good group of you know character players this is uh, japan forwards sports look sports talk podcast long very long-winded we can just call it sports talk podcast to be very specific, um, Thursday evening in Japan, the last day of March, and we're here with a special guest this evening, Rich Glessman, head coach of the B League's Ibarakots. How are you doing tonight, Rich? Uh, I am excellent. Yes, we are um, rocking and rolling here with uh, over left to uh, finish the season. So all is all is good. Just real quickly, uh, tell me what you've been doing the d- during this. Um, the weekdays of this week. Um, so since Monday, um, you're coming off a 94 78 home win over the Sun Rockers Shibuya on Sunday. So how have you been spending your time, uh, with the team? Um, well, uh, with the busy schedule, we had a game at Hokkaido on Wednesday and then we had, uh, the home game Saturday and Sunday right at scuba. Um, which is convenient because I'm actually living in scuba now. So, um, so after we won on Sunday, um, everybody just needs to take a deep breath and, uh-huh. and have a day off and the players and the staff, um, kind of just kind of get, get reloaded. And then on Tuesday, mm-hmm. um, I kind of, you know, talk to uh, one of my assistant coaches, Shogo, and we kind of get ready for, uh, the next opponent, and uh, kind of, you know, have some staff meetings on Tuesday. Mm-hmm. Players um, have more of like optional shooting, getting themselves ready. And then we start practicing on Wednesday and practice today. And then we'll have another practice kind of, you know, getting ready to go for Saturday and Sunday against Chiba. Okay. Your team, your team went, went six and three in March. Um, so a very, very positive stretch of uh, games there. Quality quality performances for the most part. Um, how do you use that uh, as kind of a um, springboard to facing the defending champion Chiba Jets now on this weekend, Saturday and Sunday, back-to-back days? Yeah, so really just trying to install confidence while having, you know, some urgency, you know, with, um, you know, as a team, just understanding, like, you know, we, mm-hmm. we were 7-3 and three in our last 10 games, and like you said, we went 6-3 and three in March, so um, from, you know, being a new B1 team and struggling to start the season with winning games, um, j- just trying to install confidence while still having that urgency, um, to just make sure that, you know, we're focused on all the stuff that we can control against a really talented team like Chiba. Are you, as a coach, are you looking forward to the, these two games as a real measuring stick of, uh, what you might want to do against a, you know, a real quality team and a team that's been very good since the B league started in 2016. Yeah. You know, I, I am at the same time. I, I think it's good, you know, obviously, um, you know, Shibuya is a talented team and, and I think beating them the previous Wednesday and then we played them again, you know, and then, um, you know, we bottom line is like within a, a two week stretch, we won two out of three games against Shibuya. Mm-hmm. And, um, that, that's a real good step, you know, in the direction. Now, obviously Chiba, you know, is a team that's really competing, you know, for a championship. And, um, I do think there's, there's a little bit of, um, yeah, like confidence and also, yeah, we want to now see we've, you know, been playing good basketball. So, you know, let's how, let's see how we stack up against one of the best teams in the league. Um, I got to be totally honest though. We only have nine, we only have nine healthy players uh-huh. and um, one of our import players is, uh, is done for the season. And I can say that now because the team has, has released that earlier today. I, I, so I saw that. Yeah. There, yeah. There's a little bit of um, for me as a coach instilling confidence and, you know, having that aggressive mindset that we got to tackle whatever situation we're in, but also, Hey, like this is going to be hard. We got to fight through this together. Mm-hmm. Uh, if I can ask you, uh, if you're able to answer, um, you're referring to Mark Trasolini, a veteran yep. forward, uh, suffering an knee injury. Uh, if I, that's right. Yeah. And yep. 
So for his contract is done for the season. Um, is there a chance the team might, you know, sign a temporary uh, somebody else to fill his spot to, for the remaining 16 games? Uh, no, unfortunately, I wish, but the um, the deadline to sign new players has has passed and and, and gone by a few, couple weeks. So, okay, right. Um, yeah, so I think it was March 14th this year. So we we missed that by you know a decent amount, and um, okay. So we, we so we will not. Yeah, that that's not an option. We we are where we are <laughs> to finish the season. So yeah. Um, there there there's 16 games remaining, like we just mentioned. Um, yeah. Other than instilling confidence, what are some other objectives you hope the team achieves between now and or early May when uh, your last game is played? Yeah, it's a good question. This whole season, you know, one of our big um, focus points has just, you know, we want to get better every day. So uh, as happy as I am with our team um, that, you know, we're, like I said, we're seven and three. In our last 10 games were 10 and nine um, since Christmas. So, you know, we've gotten way better from like where we started and, you know, that's a credit to the players, um, that we've just gotten better. We've gotten better, honestly, in every category there is. Our offense has got better. Our defense has got better. We've, we were finishing games better. Um, and so, yeah, well, I don't want this to be the, the peak of our season, right? We want to keep mm-hmm. getting better. So when we finish in May, we're at our highest peak and let the chips fall where they do if however many wins that is whatever the situation is if we're at our highest peak you know to finish the year i I think everybody will feel really good about about the season okay i think that's a fair and honest and ambitious uh target that you should want to have yeah Yeah. um i wanted to mention briefly uh about the b league we're talking about the first division of which there are 22 teams this season up from 20 last year and, you know, the Ryu- the Ryukyu Golden Kings, based in Okinawa, are having an incredible season at 37 wins and four losses. And also in the West, the Shimane Susanu Magic are 34 and 10. Of the Eastern teams, two of them so far have 30 or more wins. Kawasaki Brave Thunders at 32 and 11, and the Utsunomiya Brex at 30 and 13. Uh, the Chiba Jets, however, have played fewer games and have a higher winning percentage in the East uh, with 25 wins and seven losses. And then right behind them, the Alvar Tokyo, who won back-to-back titles before the pandemic at 29 and nine. Um, currently, the Ibaraki Robots are at 13 and 29 in their first year in B1. Tell, tell the listeners, please, Coach Glessman, um, what challenges are there in moving up from B2 to B1 in that first year? Differences in, in the competition, all new teams to scout, almost all new players except the bulk that you brought back from your team. I think it's a pretty big challenge. Yeah, no, it's definitely. And and, yeah. and again, I think myself, um, our our entire, you know, coaching staff and support staff and players, mm-hmm. I think everybody knew it was gonna be a challenge. Um, so it's not like we got hit hit out of nowhere with this, right? Um mm-hmm. we kind of knew this is a big jump. Like I, I tell, you know, some of my friends who are college coaches back home, you know, try to give me it's hard to give an exact comparison, but it's it's not it's a bigger jump than when, you know, a, a low major team, you know, if a team goes from like the America East to like the colonial like that's a little bit of a um of a jump but this is a significant jump where like it's almost like a low major mid major team jumping mm-hmm. into like a high major league to be honest with you it's 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 close to being that um substantial now again there's there's B2 players that no doubt whether import or japanese there's they can play in B1 there's no doubt but mm-hmm. there is a, a big significant difference with everything right from the overall talent the size the depth the coaching everything's mm-hmm. at a higher level in b1 mm-hmm. um you, you know you meant you did mention um uh, uh, something that you know our team we didn't add many new players um and you know that obviously um a lot of people were kind of surprised by that i think that you know um obviously we we um qualified you know in b2 and and we went 46 and 18 last year in b2 and 
um, we kept, um, you know, our, our core, um, kind of group together. And, um, I do think that helped. So there was, you know, continuity within our team. Um, mm-hmm. but there's no doubt that, you know, you're with the same group of guys and group of players. And now, even though we we get better and, you know, a couple of the additional pieces that we signed are really good players, you know, the competition level that you're going up against is just a totally different ball game, right. Than what you went up against in B2. So I think there's, there was, um, some real helpful things that we did keep our kind of core group together. Mm-hmm. Um, but also just some major challenges because, you know, we're the smallest team in B1 with the least experience and, you know, I can keep going on and on, but, um, I'd rather not even make excuses about it because uh-huh. we got a really good group of, of, you know, high character players. And that's the main reason why we've, we've been able to, to improve and, and do well here over the last month. Mm-hmm. Um, and, um, <laughs> so if I had a, if I had a group of guys that weren't bought in and didn't weren't high character guys, I think it would have been a lot harder, but I'm fortunate to have a good group of, you know, character players. I'd like to bounce around a little bit between your team, your own personal coaching background, and then the league as a whole. Um, yep. Right now, I want to just make an observation about B1 and B2 and then get your thoughts on it, okay? Yep. Uh, of the 22 teams, uh, if you look at the standings as of today, in B1, the first division of the B League, of the 22 teams, 11 have 500 or better records, so winning half or more of their games. Then you look at B2, and eight of 14 teams have uh, currently have winning records, actually. Yep. So do you think the parity and the distribution of talent is probably about what it should be in both B1 and B2? Um, you know, it, like it, to, it's a, to make yeah. like to make an interesting league for for players, fans, coaches, media. Is it about how it should be? Yeah, it's a good question. I, I think um, with with the rise of Japan basketball, I, I'll say this. I think, you know, whenever you're um, moving at a fast rate. So in my opinion, even since I've been in Japan, like mm-hmm. Japan basketball is just keeps getting better. And the B League specifically keeps getting better because the import, you know, players and the Japanese players just continue to 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 get higher talented players. There's, you know, a lot of really good coaches, whether they're Japanese coaches or import coaches, um, coming into the league. So, um, as far as, um, the best way to like set the league up, I think that's a little tricky because the bottom line is this, Ed, in the NBA, um, it's, it's more equal with like a salary cap, right? And Mm -hmm. there's no salary cap you know, if we focus it on B1, but you know, it impacts B2 too. So, you know, teams are wildly spending different, different money. Right. And, Mm -hmm. um, there's no like draft. So, so whoever comes in last the previous year, they don't get like the new best draft pick. Right. You know, a lot of times it's just about, you know, money and stuff. So, um, do I think from a, like, if you're trying to set a league up to be the most equal as possible. Do I think this is, you know, the best setup? No, I don't because some teams spend a lot, lot more money. But that being said, that being said, the longer I'm here, what, what I do, what I will say is like, I think like that Alvark and Chiba and Kawasaki and Brex, Mm -hmm. um, they, they, it's good for Japan for them to keep spending money and to treat, just, just put pressure on other teams and, you know, be fully committed to winning championships. So, um, I'm not complaining about that. I think it's actually better overall, but I think, yeah, like it's not always equal and it's not always Mm -hmm. fair to be honest with you, but also for Japan to continue moving at the rate it's going basketball wise, you need these teams who, who are, is committed to spend this type of money. Right. When you, when you think of uh, the job that you have and Mm -hmm. preparing day by day, week by week, game by game, quarter by quarter, you know, in minute by minute in, in the heat of the heat of the moment, uh, who are some of the coaches that you really um, respect and, and find, you know, you're really needing to match wits with them. And who are some of the better uh, minds in the B league? the better coaching minds 
and maybe yeah. give a little bit of highlights about what you think make them good. Sorry, that was my ringer there. I don't know if you heard that. Um, yeah, I mean, I think, I think uh, again, it's it's one of those deals where I don't want to like just single out like certain coaches, but I I, I can, you know. Could you mention a few? Yeah, yeah. that you you're impre- you're impressed right. with, and just maybe explain why. Um, Coach Die. Um, and the reason Coach Dye, you know, with Riku, you know, sticks out to me is because also I coached against him in, you know, B2 when he was with Sendai. And now I'm able to kind of mm-hmm. see what he's doing, you know, w- with Riku. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, he just has a really good defensive base. Like, I think his teams are consistent. Um, and, um, yeah, you know you're going to get, like, a really good defensive effort. I mean, I, I, I describe it as, like, tight. Like his teams have like a tight defensive balance about them. And right. he's able to, you know, he did a good job with Sendai. You know, that was a team we beat in the semifinals to 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 get to the championship, um, to get the B1 qualification. Mm-hmm. And now so you know, he did a good job mm-hmm. with, with, with the team at Sendai over the last couple of years. And then he goes to Riku with obviously totally different situation. Um, and they have talent, but as you said, they're to the top, like they have the best record in the league. And, and I think he's just done a really, really good job this year with, um, you know, blending new pieces together as a new coach, um, and just making a lot of things work where, you know, they have a lot of offensively talented players, but, but they consistently defend and their record shows that, um, so he he's definitely one that sticks out. You know, Paul, um, who coaches at Shimane, um, who I also coached against, um, it's easier for me to highlight them because, you know, I coached against him in B2 and we've moved up to B1 mm-hmm. together, right? But Paul, similarly, like I thought he did a really good job at Kagawa and then now at Shimane. Um, you know, he he's just really able to show, you know, he's a really good offensive coach. And um, I think he does a good job of holding players accountable while you know kind of being that like players coach and he's going to put a lot of pressure on you um d- you know different coaches styles than coach die where i think coach die is a little more probably def- you know defensive and you know his his yeah. set offensive yeah. actions um are you know a little bit more um you know uh you might they run their actions really good but you kind of know what's coming where you know coach paul uh you know allows a lot of freedom and um, he has really good spacing and he's got talented players. Um, obviously, Ando, I think, is one of the best, you know, point guards in the league. Um, and he just does a really good job, I think, of putting those talented players in good pieces um, to, to produce a really, really efficient offensive team. Um, co- yeah. Quickly, uh, um, you, you mentioned Paul, who uh, – Paul uh, – who is who is from New Zealand yeah. and uh, Coach Okatani Dai Okatani is from Kyoto, yeah. and you're you're an American coach, and of course with with uh, uh, with the Alvark, uh, Pavisevic is yeah. from the former Yugoslavia, yeah. so you have the European influences. Yeah, how does how do you think how do you think uh, he adds something also to the mix as being a successful coach in several leagues in Europe? Yeah, and you know having winning tactics with the Alvark winning two titles there. Yeah. Well, it speaks for itself again. You know, we, we played them earlier and earlier stretch and yeah, it, you know, he, he, he's, he's different than all these guys. And, um, he, again, I think he's, his ability to adjust, um, w- with different players is just really impressive. Um, I think, you know, when his imports have changed a little bit over the last couple of years, he can adjust, and put them in a position um, where they can um, just be really good at what they do. And, you know, they're relentless mm-hmm. with their ability to kind of attack with their four and five um, playing like basically off a string one another where one guy's right. rolling, one guy's popping, looking into high, low, getting into like fast. I call it like follow ball screen where the either they're four or five, you know, pulls on the perimeter and they just whip it into that opposite guard wing and get into the naked side ball screen. Um, you know, so, and, you know, again, he's, he's, uh, sometimes it's easy for coaches to always be like, Oh, you know, Luca 
has all this talent, but I'm, you know, I'm going to be honest with you. Sometimes when you have a lot of talent, you know, you, there's headaches that go with that and there's pressure that goes with that. So I think he does a good job of taking everything, um, with the talent that he has to, you know, consistently do a really good job. And he won two titles, like you said, before the pandemic. And then last year they weren't as good and he's, you know, made some adjustments with the roster and now their team, you know, they have a chance to, to win it all this year. There's no doubt in my mind. Absolutely. Got a difficult question here for you. If you're able to answer it, um, yep. how would you say COVID-19 has impacted how you coach, how you prepare for practices and then, you know, prepare for games these past couple of years? Yeah, I mean, it's a good question. I, I think one thing that's definitely, especially last year, you know, one thing it did make me, and I talked to players and other coaches about this, is it, it made me appreciate what, what we have. Um, a lot of my friends, especially the guys who coached at like smaller level colleges last year, they mm-hmm. had like their seasons like canceled and they weren't even a- able to like, you know, have a, a normal year. And although last year, like for us, it wasn't normal. Like that was the best, you know, coaching year I've ever had with taking, you know, Ibaraki robots to be one. And it was just, it was awesome. And you saw that like, it can easily be taken away from you. Right. So the year before we weren't able to finish the season. Right. So I appreciated everything the COVID, you know, with, with uh, the year that we had last year and the year we're having now, like, you know, the one thing that, that I say with COVID is it, it makes you appreciate what you have. Um, but at the same time, at the same time, there's, you know, you know, we just had a player test positive yesterday and he's, he's one of our better, you know, players and he's out for, um, the next two weeks. So you gotta, you gotta roll with things like day to day. I I think coaches will tell you, you know, coaches, we like to have everything like set and planned. And so we can kind of like control the chessboard, but Mm -hmm. that's not how COVID-19 doesn't let you control the chessboard. You got to be able to deal with things like day to day. And, um, I think, I think you appreciate that, Hey, it is what it is. And we just got to roll with the, with the punches. And if, you know, player X test is, you know, positive, we got to support player X, but we also have to then, um, deal with playing our next game, our next two weeks without him. And you can't, you can't, you can't, you can't complain about it. You can't make excuses about it. You just got to move on. Let me, let me switch the topic to your coaching career for a couple moments here. Um, first of all, you played college ball, finishing your college ball at Emerson college yes. uh, in Massachusetts as a point guard or a guard, right? Yes. Many years how ago. Did that, yes. How did that help prepare you to become a coach? And then tell me a little bit about the benefits of your coaching travels, your path going from division three as a women's head coach to working in division two and division one programs at Adelphia university in division two at Long Island University in Division One, and then at Duquesne University in Division One, before you arrived at Ehime with the B2's uh, Ehime Orange Vikings in 2017. Yeah, so um, I, I played, had a great college uh, Division Three experience. Um, I was at a, you know, um, a good, um, just, just Emerson, the Division Three program that I played for, um, I wouldn't change that experience for anything. Um, I, you know, had a great relationship with my teammates, my head coach guy whose name is Hank Smith, who now works for, um, the Oklahoma city thunder. Um, my experience was so good. I, I tell people like, I, I actually wasn't sure I was going to be, you know, involved in basketball or a coach, um, mm-hmm. while I was in college, but the experience that I had, um, when I got out of it, I was like, Oh, you know what? I, I want to keep doing that. I want to keep being part of a, um, of a college of, of a basketball team. And, you know, I was a good division three player, but I, I wasn't good enough to keep playing professionally. Um, mm. so then it was like, okay, well, if I can't, you know, keep playing professionally, um, why not? Why not? Why not be a coach? Right. So, and, and, um, and you were, you were the youngest women's uh, the youngest division uh, or NCAA coach in the country at yeah. that one point, right? When you started yeah. at Wheelock College? 
Yeah. So, so that's a funny story too. I, I helped out a little bit with the, with the women's team at my alma mater as I was finishing up at Emerson. And uh-huh. then just coincidentally the next year before I was even in coaching, it was kind of one of those deals, like a friend of a friend, or I, I don't even remember how, but like they needed a coach with like four days before the season started. <laughs> so I showed up at like 22 years old and, uh, but you know, again, like that, you know, it was a good experience because I had no idea what I was doing and I had no idea what I was getting into. And that kind of like set the bar where like, all right, if you want to like do this full time here, you know, you got to go somewhere under, um, under a really good coach and, you know, kind of, you know, move up the ladder that way. And that's what I did. And so I went to Adelphi, you know, after that and, um, worked for a really good division two head coach, a guy by the name of Jamie Cosgrove, who's a stud defensive coach. And then from there I went to, to LIU Brooklyn. Um, and I was with, you know, Jim Ferry, who's, who's a great coach. So I, I had three really influential, um, people that I played for and worked with, um, mm-hmm. that helped me, yeah, become, you know, the coach that I, that I was able to become. And what do you think are your strengths as a head coach? Yeah, I mean, I think obviously, like offensively, um, I can, um, I, I try to allow a lot of freedom for our players to to put them in the best position to make plays and, um, you know, play at like a high speed of attack, you know, mm-hmm. so I think um, from the outside, people would, you know, outside and inside, probably people would say, you know, that's, that's one of my, you know, strengths. And, um, I think, um, you know, the older that you get, you know, it's important to kind of know what your strengths are and, you know, know what the things that you, your weaknesses and the stuff that you, you have to be better at, you know? So even like this year, although, um, B1, like the defenses are, are, um, are just way more efficient and better. Um, and you know, we have some, some, um, disadvantages we're able to you know for the most part i think compete while still playing like with our offensive speed of attack and especially the last half of the year at the beginning Mm -hmm. i was kind of even questioning my not myself but just you know what like we might not be able to play the style that i want um this Mm -hmm. season but we kind of stuck with it and um you, you know since the second, you know, half of the year, the last couple months, like I said, we're 10 and nine and, you know, we're playing at like the offensive speed of attack that, you know, kind of, I played in Ehime and played with the robots last year. Do you think going through the second half of the season, the, your own adjustments for game plan and practice, you know, um, like the structure of practice is really tied to maybe also being able to understand how you want your team to scout other teams a little bit differently? Maybe that's gotten a little easier with by being around more of the teams. You know, possibly. And I think part of it too is just that. Um, I, I think, yeah, it's like anything else. When when you get more familiar with the teams that you're going up against, mm-hmm. you know, it, it's always helpful. There's no doubt. But but I think honestly, like the pl- I think the players. I got to give like the players more credit on that because I think part of it too is like you know, we have a lot of guys who have never played, um, in this level, right. In B1 Mm -hmm. and they, they've done a good job, um, over the last couple of months as, you know, to be honest with you, it helps us that the B1 season is so long, six games, early October to early May. So we have a lot of time. We have a lot of time to figure it out. Now at the beginning of the year, I was worried that, Oh geez, the season's too long, but how it's gone it's been helpful for us that the season is long because I do think the, the players, um, you know, have, have done a really good job of like, as it, as time goes on, seeing kind of like what works. Okay. You know what? Like, well, you know, one player I have, you know, Kohei Fukuzawa, who's one of the best shooters I've ever been around. You know, he, he's, he's able to find his shots better he's getting more comfort threes than he was early on in the year and we're doing a better job helping him get those shots but he's also just understanding angles and you know the fact that you know he has to potentially shoot deeper or shoot quicker and what you know specific actions help him get shots you know Mm -hmm. um so i i think rather than like 
practice and my adjustments, I think the players, the longer and more games they've played in B1, they, they've just gotten more confident and they've adjusted, to be honest with you. Okay. Did you have time for a, a few more questions, uh, Coach? Yes, of course. We're, yep. we're roughly at about 30 minutes, but this is our first of these Twitter Space podcasts for sports talk. So maybe we can go a little bit longer this time and see how it goes. Yeah. There's a lot, a lot, um, a lot of pressure, a lot of pressure being number one, right? Yeah. Um, let's, let's rewind for a minute and think back to your arrival in Ehime with the orange Vikings in 2017. Uh, what was that first season like being an overseas coach, deal, you know, needing to work with a translator for day-to-day -day life and, and for, you know, interaction with players and, and making the game plans and everything else. How did that experience differ in your mind from being a college coach in the States? Yeah. You know, that, that year, I gotta be honest that year, I'm never going to have another year like that in my life again, probably because every other year you come back to Japan, you know what to expect. So mm -hmm. the bottom line is like when I left for, for Japan, specifically, like you said, you know, Matsuyama, Ehime, I had no idea like what I was getting into, like, like good, bad, indifferent. I had no idea. I had never been to Asia like before in my life. Right. So, so um, let's go on for one second. Sorry. Yeah. Um, did you get hired over the phone or did you meet the, you know, team management in the States? How did that come about? You know, that's a good question. So, um, to I, I, from a friend of a friend, I connected with, with Toshi Koga, um, an agent here. And, um, mm -hmm. he told me about this opportunity, but then like nothing happened for like a couple of weeks. And okay. so I just assumed that like, you know, that, that ship had sailed. Right. So that then like, you know, on a random, you know, night while I'm like with my wife and two young sons, he messaged me like, Hey, you, you still interested in Japan? You know, this team, Ehime Orange Vikings, they need a coach. And I said, yeah, I would be interested. And then he must've talked to them like that day or the next day or whatever. Cause then the next day he hit me, he hit me with like the contract details. Okay. And I talked to my wife and that was it. So we were, we were, we were ready to roll after that. But that, but that, like you said, the experience of coming here, you really didn't know what to expect because you hadn't been, no. been in Asia. You hadn't been in right. uh, Matsuyama or been to a B league game. Um, do you right. think it's really helped you grow as a coach coming to a completely unknown environment? Yes. No, no question. Uh, no question. And um, I, I would really, again, it's easier said than done. A lot of coaches aren't either able to get a job or they have families. They, they can't do it. I would recommend every coach, at not it doesn't even have to be basketball but if they could ever um just even for one year like you know go in in have an international coaching experience mm -hmm. i can't tell you how much i recommend that because it's going to help them be more flexible learn learn about communication um i yeah i mean it, for me it was you know life changing um and obviously, like, you know, I, my wife um, likes Japan. And I think I didn't come to Japan just by accident. Like I decided I wanted to, you know, focus on coming to Japan because I knew um, basketball wise that they were putting money in. They had a new league. They were putting money into it that the league in the country in general were on the on the rise. Like mm -hmm. I knew that I wanted to try to go to a place that wasn't going down, that was going on the upswing mm -hmm. and Japan stuck out to me that it was really going on the upswing. And, um, you know, and then to be honest with you though, like I was, I was fortunate because as you know, Ed, like a lot of coaches come over here in like impossible situations and they get yeah. fired and they can't get another job. Right. And right, so right. one shot only one shot. And so, you know, um, we had a good year, the first year at Ahime. So then I could stay, <laughs> then, I, then I could, then I could come back after, after the first year. And I, you know, I had a couple of, uh, you know, Toshi, um, you know, was my, my captain there, Tate, like we, I had really good, um, you know, Japanese guys who, who helped me out a lot. 
Um, and, you know, Tap Shea Tapscott was uh, who I coach now, was one of the imports. Um, so I had nothing to do with putting the team together. I got lucky with with um, with the guys that were there. And, you know, I think that's a big part of it. It really is. I mean, a lot of good coaches, um, you know, can come over here and they get into a bad situation and it's a reflection on them where, you know, you, you got to make you got to make the best use of every opportunity you have. But I will say, you know, some jobs are harder than others over here, right? Would would you would you characterize um, your work as being? Uh, do you feel you've you've had pretty good relationships with the front offices, both in Ehi Bay and uh, with Ibaraki? You know, in dealing with the general manager and the owners. Yeah, I mean, I think I think it's again, it's communication based. You know, mm -hmm. um, Yuhura San was um, my GM um, last year, and he was just awesome. I mean. <laughs> You know, it's easy to focus on the coach, the players, um, your son who um, in Hori san and Yamiya san too. Like it was, I came at a good time because they had been working together for a while, right? So, mm -hmm. um, you know, it starts with the owner, Hori san, the owner of the robots, is a really good owner, and then he had a good president with Yamiya san, and then the GM, your <laughs> son, who was, you know, around the team and me and stuff, and. Um, just, just really good. Just a really good guy, and he did a great job putting the team together. Um, so that 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 made it, you know, really special too with what we did last year. And um, Yami Asan and Yohara Asan have moved on um, to different jobs, and you know now we have a new president GM who mm -hmm. who are good as well. Um, so with with Ehime, I'll say this: with Ehime, it was very different. I would compare it like the the robots, especially now being in B one. Like we have, you know. A lot of staff we have, I know we don't have as big of an operation as, as a lot of other B1 teams, but we have a lot of staff and resources. Um, mm -hmm. Ehime eh wasn't like that, right? It was, Ehime eh was like more small college style, right? you know, where, where um, the robots in B1 are more like big brand, you know, college well, we, basketball. So, Well, let's talk about that a little bit uh, from the standpoint of, the team is sort of a big fish in a s small pond, so to speak, or like the big show in town uh, yep. among sports. What is the general vibe around the team, like in the community? People know the name. People know the team, right? Yeah. And again, uh, that 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 starts with Horizon. So Horizon, the robots were nothing. Uh, again, I, I wasn't here. But I, I so this is what, you know, everything, you know, they they were a struggling franchise that probably wasn't going to last too much longer and hori san um you know bought the team and um you know Hor you know with his um globus you know the, the the business that he's built from the ground up with globus and stuff and he's from ibaraki from mito specifically and you know he he then um they built a brand new arena adestria uh yeah. arena in the center of mito and that was a huge help. And, um, you know, um, that, that's really what kickstarted it. And, um, yeah, like the, the community, um, you know, is, is behind the team and obviously with going from B2 to B1 this year, it's, it's exciting. Um, I think obviously the community <laughs> wants the robots to stay in B1. Um, but you're right. Like definitely because there's, there's, um, there's not other, um, there's not other sports teams at this level, like in, in around the Mito area. Um, mm -hmm. The robots obviously are, are are a big deal to people, and you know we we take that very very serious. That you know we want to represent, you know Ibaraki and Mito in the best way possible. I, I believe just as a going back to your point about the owner uh, Hori San, I believe. Yep. Uh, he bought the team in either 2013 or 2014. I, I think it's been, I think it's been seven, eight That's years now. Um, yeah. Eight, nine, yeah. Maybe it's a little bit shorter. I don't have that yeah. figure in front of me, but yeah, definitely the knowing the history of the franchise before economically, it has been stabilized and there's more continuity and there was investment made again. Importantly, the arena was built. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, br briefly here, coach, um, can you highlight a few of the players that you believe are the best all-around players in the B-League 
And then can you talk about your roster and who are some of the most exciting players uh, on your team? Yeah, no, I mean, um, like, again, I don't want to um, just always like name like the, the, uh, you know, the guys that uh, everybody knows, but, you know, obviously like the, the, the players in the league and, and, you know, I, I, I've seen, um, video footage and talk to people. And, you know, again, that's kind of what I was saying before, where having Japan being on the upswing, like, you know, it, the player, the Japanese players just have gotten a lot better, you know, and it's obviously it starts with Hachimura and Watsonabe, but like, you know, there's some other guards now in, um, in the B league that are just really talented players, you know, I mean, we're going up against one of them this weekend, right. With Togashi. Um, you know, what makes him tough? What makes him tough? Just how quick he is, how he can shoot, pass, dribble with the speed that he plays with. So obviously he's smaller, um, but he's he uses his speed um, at just a really high level. So, you know, when he's using a ball screen, um, he can shoot. So you can't play off him. So you got to guard him tight, but he's so crafty with the ball, right? It's kind of mm-hmm. like that Chris Paul thing where you can't play off him because he can he can shoot but he's really crafty with, with the ball in his hands. So, you know, offensively, he really makes Chiba go despite, you know, they have awesome players playing around him. You know, he, he, he does stick out as, you know, one of the more talented guards in the league, but, um, you know, Ando for, for Shimane is really impressive. Um, uh, Hajima, you know, with, with Brex, I, I just think is just a really impressive, you know, player. And these are guys who, um, you know, can do a lot of different things on the court. They're not one dimensional players that, that, that really kind of sticks out to me where they can score, they can pass, they can really help their team win in a variety of ways. Looking at your roster and your team, um, who are just for people to give them a kind of an introduction to your team, who are some of your better players? And is there a player or two that has really made a mark you know, most improved player or most improved players since training camp began. Yeah. The, the, you know, there is one guy, um, but I'll, I'll kind of go through, um, you know, positionally um, just to, to quickly here, give, give uh, listeners an update. Um, so Atsu hero is our captain. I thought he was uh, one of the best um guards in b2 last year i i think he's been a b1 player and he's kind of proving that now um he's had a good year he got hurt in the middle of the year but he's our you know captain starting point guard um guy who can you know use his speed to to score while also getting guys shots um i'm lucky to to have you know coached him now two years um Kohei Fukuzawa is, uh, he's only about, I think he's listed at 177 centimeters. I, I don't know if he's that tall, but he, he at <laughs> one point had the most threes, um, in the history of the B league. I don't know where it's at right now, but, um, just one of the best shooters I've ever seen. And, um, like I mentioned before, he's kind of now finding his way to, to just be able to shoot, you know, mm-hmm. seven games. He had 30 against Kawasaki. He had, uh, 20, I think he had 28 against um kyoto a couple weeks ago i mean he he can score in bunches um so and then asahi tajima who's a who's a veteran um who played with okaido for the previous i think seven years um you know just a lot of b1 experience right that we don't have in other um in other positions so he he i can play i i usually play the you know the three of those guys you know together as like the one and two and i kind of don't have a set point guard a lot of times you know we'll play um the two of those guys uh, two of those three players as kind of like combo guards um, right so yeah the, the the player that i would say when you ask about most improved is um uh, is suru um so suru uh Suru, I think, leads us in in minute in uh, minutes over the last couple of months, and he is a uh, is our leader in plus minus, um, which you know just says a lot. And he averaged, I think, like 
he ended up starting at the end of last year in, in with our B2 season. But Surumaki, like he, he only averaged, I think, like 12 minutes a game last year because he wasn't playing a lot early in the year, but he just kept working. And I mean, now at times it's hard for me to take him off the, off the floor. Um, and he is a high level defender and he's just improved his shooting. He's improved his decision-making. He has improved his free throw rate. He, he's improved at everything going from B2 to B1. So do you, do you use him as kind of a swing man? Yeah, I do. But you know what? Like it's kind of, I'm, I'm to the point I said this to, you know, some of our, my assistant coaches recently, like it's almost like we, I, we, I, I still think of him sometimes too much as like a wing. Like he's mm-hmm. got some like big guard skills now where I gotta, I gotta kind of like sometimes, you know, put him in more of a position to run a play for him to use a ball screen. And he, he's, he's just emerged with his ability to create. So I, I think I would say he's like, you know, a three or a swingman, whatever you say. But again, trying to give the players freedom, like I have no problem with him with the ball in his hands making a play. Um, so, you know, he, 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 again, like from any player that I've coached in Japan and America at the, at the collegiate level, some guys can make big jumps right from their freshman to sophomore year, no doubt. But like Suru's really made a huge, huge jump in the last year. And that's a credit to him. It's a credit to him. And he's only uh, 25 yeah. years old. He'll turn 26 uh, uh, in, in April. That's right. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. So he's got a bright future. If he keeps keeps going at this rate, he's, he's going to make a lot of money. Um, yeah. uh, go ahead. Go ahead. Um, yeah. Yeah. And then, you know, our, our um, obviously um, we have, you know, some, some depth with, you know, some guys who were on the roster last year. I'm kind of just giving you like the, the, the guys who play the most minutes, because that's probably who fans want to hear about. Um, but, um, you know, our import players who now are here are, are Shay Tapscott, who was, you know, played B2. This is his first year in B1. And, you know, he was struggling a little bit to start the season, um, but he's been dynamite the last uh, month or so. He had 34 and 9 and 6 against Shibuya um on uh on sunday and yeah i mean he's he's figuring out i mean his size at times is an issue in b1 um but he, he he can just score he's always been able to score and i think he's one of those guys that he's starting to show people that um you know sometimes labeling somebody just as a b2 player um if they're in the right situation they they can you know contribute mm-hmm. you know at the b1 level um and then uh, Eric Jacobson is our other, you know, import um, who's just been awesome recently. He's he's one of those guys that you know his stat. You might look at his stats, and you know he's got you know he had fifteen and eight, but it doesn't tell the true tale of like how impactful he was in the game um, with his screening, with his you know one on one defense in the post, his ability to run the floor, to roll hard on ball screens and open up the floor for other players. Um he he's really taken his game to another level since January, February. And he he was hurt earlier in the year. He had a knee and an ankle issue. So it took him a little time to get going. Um but he's really again, he he's really I think shown he's a B one player. Um since January that that's and again, I'm obviously I'm their coach. So I'm, yeah. I'm partial well, to yeah. these guys, but I, 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 if anybody watched Eric play recently, he, he's playing against, you know, high level players and he is at times, you know, getting the best of them. So that to me shows that he can, you know, play at this level. You, you speak about high level players and there are several former NBA players in this league and, yep. you know, even even players like Sebastian Size of um, of the Alvark, who has played for the Spain national team in recent years, you know, very good yep. quality international players. Absolutely. High, high level. I mean, you know, I, I the Sunrise is technically four. We have Frenchie is out for this. He's still on their roster. And so, you know, you got four guys on their roster with NBA experience. I mean, that's, that's saying a lot, right? With Ryan Kelly, McAdoo, 
um, yeah. Harrelson and Kevin Jones, who they just signed, you know, um, had, you know, so it's, uh, yeah, it shows, it shows, you know, the, the level that, you know, the, these teams just have talent. And like you said, Sebastian Saez is one of the best imports in the league. And yeah, he doesn't have NBA experience, but his, his international experience, you know, speaks volumes and, you know, he's, he's, he's hands down one of the best forwards in the league. What, uh, one final question here, coach. Um, you yep. grew up in Massachusetts and I'm, I'm guessing you were probably a Celtics fan growing up. Uh, I was. if so, who was your favorite player on the, on Boston as a kid? Yeah. So, so my grandfather, uh, former Boston cop, um, I had no, I had no choice, but to, to wear green on, uh, on, and whenever the Celtics were in the playoffs, uh, everyone wore green and, um, my grandfather was going to be in a bad mood if the Celtics didn't win. So I had no choice, but to, uh, to bleed green with the Celtics. Um, you know, it, it has to be Larry bird. Um, bird was an icon, you know, so I grew up in the eighties. I was born in 78. So I was young when bird was like really in his heyday. Um, mm -hmm. but he still had, you know, had a big like presence, you know, in my house and everybody who was in the Boston area. It's hard to go past Larry Bird um, in my childhood. But, you know, they Dennis Johnson, Ainge, Robert Parrish and Mikhail, they were all, you know, very, very present um, in uh, my childhood as I would, you know, watch games with my grandfather growing up. So um, that must it was an awesome, awesome time. That must have been fun to share the, those memories with your grandfather. It was. Um, yeah, it was awesome. Yeah. Well, so. I'd like to encourage I'd like to encourage listeners to check out the Ibaraki Robots games and game highlights. Uh, if you're in Japan, go to the arena, go to this, go to their games, watch them on watch their YouTube highlights as well to get familiar with them. And yes. I want to thank you, Coach Glessman, for being on our program tonight. Hey, thank you very much. I appreciate it. And again, thank you for all the stuff that you're doing um, for the B-League. Again, uh, you're definitely one of the, the pioneers and, and the guys that, you know, is helping um, just, you know, in the media, get it out how good um, the B-League is. And, you know, I appreciate it. Uh, thank you for your patience tonight and getting started. But um, I appreciate the uh, thoroughness of our interview. And Please follow coverage of the B-League at Sports Look and Japan Forward.